Well, hello everyone. We are here again uh, going through this incredible technology called YouTube. I believe we're on, oh good grief, I think this is our fifth time that we have met here during this new series called Renewed Hope. If you've been able to, to join us over the past uh, five weeks or over the past couple weeks in person as we've been uh, resuming services here at Faith Church uh, at the 930 hour and the 11 o'clock hour and as people continue to trickle in. It's so good to see your faces that I haven't been able to see uh, in, a number of, in a number of weeks. But uh, we're going to continue in our teaching series called Renewed Hope. Before we get into that, actually, today, I uh, just want to continue to remind you of ways that you can connect. And obviously, you've been connecting, if you're watching this, with YouTube. Uh, if you've been on our Facebook site, I just encourage you to do that. All kinds of information and encouragement out there for you for that. Also, if you haven't been on our website, I encourage you to do that, www.myfaithchurch.org. All kinds of resources um, that are available for you and for your children as well during this time when we're kind of starting to trickle back in but not quite yet fully uh, invested yet. And any questions that you may have, uh, you can always email the church at info at myfaithchurch.org. Just continue to continue to be faithful in your in your in your contributions in your giving and during this time when you might not be able to physically put that you know obviously in the offering plate a uh, number of you have gotten on our website you've clicked the donate button or you've texted to 73256 and and continue to uh, to do that and we thank you for your faithfulness it allows us to be generous uh, in return so well we're going to address a topic here this morning and one of the benefits that we have of going through a, a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse, is oftentimes we'll come across topics. And we, when we come across these topics, it allows us to pause and address these topics. What we're going to address actually today is this idea of telling truth when it's tough. I've been in situations where I've had to make a phone call to a family that their son was in a car accident. I don't know how I got the phone call first, but somehow I was the designated truth teller, you know, in those situations. Um, I've had to sit parents down as a youth pastor and say, hey, I, I heard something about your, your daughter that I think you need to know, and I think it's true. I, I've been in those situations. You have probably been in those situations as well, and depending on your personality, uh, those can be really tough. You know, as a Jesus follower, we're called to communicate tough truth. I'm not sure you can get around it. And so how do we do that? What's the best way to communicate tough truth? You know, as a pastor, I'm a kind of guy, I just, I just like people. And one of the toughest things for me is to communicate tough truth. You know, when a person comes and sits in my office and they start talking about their scenario in their life and they've made some horrible choices, you know, I'm faced with the decision. Do I communicate, no, everything's just going to be okay, and that's not going to solve anything? Or do I have to say, Lord, this is going to be tough for them to hear, and I'm going to try to do it in a way that is compassionate and loving and godly, but I have to say this. I mean, your word is truth. And in order for us to change, we have to hear the truth and apply the truth, and that transforms us, right? And so being a truth teller is part of what being a Jesus follower is. It's not a role that we necessarily relish. It's not something that our culture actually triumph or trumpets, you know. It's kind of mind your own business, you know. Let everybody live the way they want to live. But if you're a Jesus follower, I think this this video or you know this passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at here this morning or this afternoon whenever you may be watching this right during this time you know if you were able to join us last week Samuel received this call from God he is sleeping in the tabernacle he hears this voice he thinks it's Eli this person that is his, his mentor a father figure we won't go back and go through the whole background of Samuel but he was given to the Lord at a very young age and Eli had served as the priest for a number of years. He's about 90 years old at this time. Samuel's about 10 to 12. Eli has not been a good father. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were in the bloodline of taking over after Eli would pass, uh, they were horrible. The scripture calls them scoundrels. 
They're robbing from God's house. They're intimidating and robbing from God's people. They're sleeping with the female attendants of God's tabernacle. I mean, they're doing everything wrong that a priest shouldn't do and not doing anything that a priest ought to do, right? And so God is very patient and generous in his grace. And you know, during the 400 years of the book of Judges, the priesthood just started going downhill. Eli's family line. And yet at the same time, God's discipline is very thorough. And a couple of weeks ago, we looked at a passage of scripture that there's someone that is just described as a man of God. And we don't know who this person is. Someone who had told Eli tough truth from the Lord. That his family line was coming to an end and that, you know, he was going to be judged and his sons, Hophi and Phinehas, their, you know, the sins of them and uh, horrible news. And then last week, Samuel receives this calling from the Lord, right? And Eli knew that it was the Lord that was calling and, and, and speaking to Samuel. And so we're actually going to see the passage of Scripture. Eli, I think, knows what is coming. And so without further ado, if you have your Bible, turn to chapter 3 of the book of 1 Samuel, Renewed Hope. God is restoring hope in families. He's restoring hope in, the, in his own house by cleaning house. Eventually, we're going to see him restoring hope in the entire nation of Israel. But in order to restore, restore hope, sometimes tough truths need to be communicated. And we're going to see that. Starting in verse 11 of chapter 3, this is what the scripture says. And the Lord said to Samuel... See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family. This was the man of God a couple weeks ago. We looked at this. Would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about but did nothing about, right? His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel laid down until morning. It doesn't say that he slept. You know, he had just seen the Lord, if that was not enough. He had heard the Lord's voice, if that was not enough to keep an 11, 12-year-old boy up. The message that he's receiving here, that he's going to have to communicate to Eli, his father figure or grandfather figure in many ways, I'm sure that was a sleepless night. But he lays down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, understandably why. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. And Samuel answered, here I am. What was it that he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord, let him do what is good in his eyes. If you know anything about the theme of the book of Judges, the theme of the book of Judges is everyone has did what was right in their own eyes, and the priesthood, and Eli was a part of that, allowed it to happen. And here Eli is kind of coming around to this understanding, I, I've messed up. And so he says, let the Lord just do what is right in his eyes, right? Because we've been living according to our own eyes, right? And so he continues, the Lord was with Samuel, this is verse 19, as he grew up, and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. His words carried weight. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Now, here's our key thought is, how do we speak truth when the truth isn't necessarily what we want to share? When I look at Samuel's life, there was a number of times where Samuel was called to deliver news from the Lord that he didn't necessarily want to share. And here at age 10, 11, 12, you know, right off the bat, God is making clear, Samuel, during this stage, in this point of history with my people, I need a priest that is not afraid and will communicate tough truth. Eventually, we're going to see that Samuel had to communicate tough truth to another person that he loved by the name of Saul, the very first king of Israel. And eventually, he gains this reputation and as this truth teller, as this straight shooter, 
and people respected him. Sometimes they feared him. In fact, when Samuel goes to a place, and he was directed to do this by the Lord, to go to this place called Bethlehem to meet a guy by the name of Jesse, who had a number of sons, and David was one of those sons. The scripture actually tells us that when he entered into that town, the people were just shaken and frozen in fear, right? Because here comes the truth teller, Samuel. Being a truth teller is not always easy, but being a truth teller is necessary. Right? And so we have a number of observations that we're gonna make here that of how we can communicate truth the way that God desires us to communicate truth. You know, when it comes to the hard truth that I believe God is calling us to share, it's not something that we should say, I really relish this. I really like putting the hammer down. I don't think God is telling us to do that kind of stuff. But I do think that he is telling us not to be afraid because it is actually the compassionate response. And so we're just going to jump in here, wherever you may be, this morning, afternoon, whenever you may be watching this. Here's some observations that we have. Here's number one. Commit yourself to the truth for it forms and reveals your character. We actually see that when Samuel is communicating this truth to the Lord, it is also solidifying, solidifying the kind of character that God desires his high priest to have. You know, during the time of judges and during the time of, of you know, Eli's reign, he just, they didn't communicate hard truth. And they didn't have the kind of character. They were corrupt. And Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, they were corrupt. And yet we see at the beginning of really the start of Samuel taking the reins, even at a young age, Samuel is committed to telling the truth, even when the truth is tough. And look what the scripture says. We've already read it, but here's just a bit of review. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Now this word tingle does not mean gossip. That if you have something that is true about somebody, this is not what God is saying. Hey, hey, I'm gonna give you some really juicy stuff that's gonna to happen to the house of Eli and his sons. And so Samuel, you just go ahead and you just make people's ears just ring, right? This is not what God is saying. This is not a license, even if it's true, to go ahead and spread gossip, that kind of stuff. This word tingle actually means to resound, kind of like hitting a cymbal. When I was a kid, I can remember that, uh, I don't know if it was a state fair or a local fair, but my, my parents took us to a tractor pull. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of going to a tractor pull, but but, uh, you know, they look like dragsters, you know, type of thing. Huge tires on the back, you know, and it's extremely loud. And I was a young boy at the time, and we're sitting in metal bleachers and kind of, you know, a metal kind of amphitheater, you know, at this fair. And the first time that a tractor, you know, put the accelerator down, you know, it, it just vibrated off that, those metal bleachers. And my natural reaction as, I don't know, seven years old was just to go, like that because it was so loud it hurt my ears so I did that on the first one I think I did that on the second one and then I look over at my dad and during the tractor my pull my, my dad's not covering his ears now I didn't realize at the time that he's probably a little older and didn't have sensitive hearing like I did as a seven-year-old I probably wouldn't have to cover my ears now I can't hear anything right but I thought I want to be tough like my dad you know and so I'm not gonna put my hands over my ears and so during that entire time, all the tractors that came, all the, the, the loud noise, I would just sit there and just white knuckle it. You know, my ears are killing me, but I'm not going to put my hands over my ears because my dad's not putting his hands over his ears. Well, I paid for that, you know, for the next couple days. I had this, this ringing, you know, in, in my ears until my ears kind of healed. This is actually what this word make means, is that this truth is so true. <laughs> that it is, it's not gonna to need to be spread through gossip. The words of God that is coming down on the household of Eli will just resound in the ears as a warning. You don't mess around, right? 
It's not about juicy gossip that even though it might be true, you know, truth telling does not give us a license to go ahead and spread what might be true so that other people's ears may tingle. But when God speaks, and we see this all through Samuel's life, his words resounded. They were gongs in ears. They tingled because they rang with the element of truth. This is the very first verse, you know, verse 11 that we looked at. And then the last couple of verses that we looked at, what does it say about Samuel's character? Well, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Why? Because he was a straight shooter and everybody knew that. He communicated tough truth. And when Samuel spoke, it resounded in people's ears. He was listened to. And yet we see God forming and shaping the character of Samuel as he is preaching and communicating truth to people. What do we see here? Well, and all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, these, this saw is, or Samuel as is God's voice, right? attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. So we get this information, we get this application, and we get this transformation. We see this with Samuel. The Lord continued to appear, to speak, at Shiloh, and there revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So Samuel is receiving the information. He's not like Hophni and Phinehas. He's not just receiving the information and not applying it to his life. He is respected because he is consistent in his lifestyle. It gives him a platform to adequately share the truth that has been communicated to him, and it's transforming his reputation. It's transforming his character. You've probably heard me say this before that, you know the reason why we come and we open up the scriptures is not just to, for knowledge sake. In fact, the scripture says of itself that knowledge just puffs up. We open up the scriptures in order to apply the scriptures, in order for the scriptures to transform us as we apply it to our life. It is, it is information, it is application, and it is transformation. And we see this in Samuel's life. He's hearing from the Lord. He is applying it to his own life first. He is consistent in his lifestyle, unlike Eli, unlike Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and it is transforming in his own life. And people saw it. The lack of respect that they had for Hophni and Phinehas is what the scripture says. They did not respect these guys. Why? Because they may have had the information, but they weren't applying it to their life. And it wasn't transforming their life. They didn't have the words that resounded in the ears like Samuel did. Why? He heard from the Lord. He got the information. He applied it to his life. It transformed him. And then also he was able to communicate it to people. And his words carried weight because of the character that he possessed. Right? One of the best ways that we can communicate truth to people is we are just consistent in our character ourself. We're humble before the Lord. We receive the information. We apply it to our lives. There's transformation that occurs in our own lives. I'm sure you've probably under, you understand this, that if you are trying to speak truth and you are not yet living that truth yourself, the likelihood that that truth is going to be received very well isn't very high. But we see that actually with Samuel. He was consistent. In fact, that's one of the, the highlights of Samuel's life. One of the few people in the scripture, honestly, that there's very little negative about. You know, Moses had a temper issue. David had an issue with women that he passed on to his son Solomon. Uh, Abraham lied. Jacob had a whole slew of issues, right? But Samuel was just consistent. He was the right guy in the right place at the right time. And he was needed to communicate this tough truth to people who continued to reject it during the time of Judges for 400 years. The best way that we can communicate truth is to give ourselves a platform, right? Applying the word of the Lord to our own lives first, allowing that transforming work of the Holy Spirit to occur, having that kind of a platform so that when God does prompt us to speak hard truth, it doesn't fall on deaf ears, 
but it falls on ears that tingle. Why? Because we're living the correct way. Well, here's number two, right? Number two is this. Confirm your convictions to shape your compassion. Convictions always ought to shape our compassion and not the other way around, where our compassion shapes our convictions. When I look at Eli and what he allowed his sons to do, I kind of wonder if this was a little bit Eli. His compassion for his son. I think he loved his sons. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to say anything bad that would hurt their feelings. And then it got so bad that finally when he did try to correct his sons, his sons didn't listen. You know, there's this thing in our culture right now that says, and it's not just recently, it's actually been there for a while. You know, you've probably heard phrases, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Uh, I'm not sure that's biblically accurate. I understand perhaps maybe the thought behind that we should be we should be kind. But when it comes to saying the tough things, it is actually more compassionate to say the tough things than just not to say something and just kind of let things slide. We see that in the life of Eli. We see that actually in the life of all of the priests in the book of Judges, they simply told people what they wanted to hear because they were polite or because they were wimps or, or because, you know, they didn't want to, uh, you know, give up their meal ticket or, or whatever it may be. But it is always more compassionate to actually communicate hard truth. And then just allow, instead of just allowing, you know, people to kind of go their own way. Let's look at what the scripture says here, right? Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Look at the word afraid. He was afraid to hurt Eli's feelings. I think he loved Eli. Eli was like a grandfather or a father figure to him. He had lived really most of his life in the house of Eli, serving this elderly man. He cared for him. And I also think that Eli cared for Samuel. And yet what do we see here? Right? This is Eli talking to Samuel. What was it that the Lord said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. And we have to give it to Eli here. I think God was preparing him because the man of the Lord actually said, this is what's going to happen. I think that Eli just knew this was probably going to be a confirmation of this. And he says to Samuel, may God deal with you, be it ever more severely, if you hide it from me, uh, hide from me anything that he told you. So we have the fear of hurting Eli's feelings. And then we have Eli saying to Samuel, your fear of the Lord should trump your feelings of hurting my feelings, right? You know, when it comes to communicating truth, there's all kinds of fears, right? We fear being rejected. We fear the end of a relationship. We fear being misunderstood. Maybe we even fear the finger being pointed back at us. I mean, there's all kinds of legitimate fears. When we look at Eli, his household was judged. His sons committed horrible acts, but Eli was judged as well. Why? Not because he had a firsthand participation in these acts, but because he allowed those acts to occur when he should have been a communicator of truth. He did not say what he ought to have said early on with his sons, he was a man, I think, who was just, I just, I don't want to hurt them. And he allowed them to continue down this horrible, destructive path. The compassionate thing would have been to say the hard things to his sons early. And I think he's starting to understand this at the age of 90, where he says to Samuel, lay it on me. It may hurt me. I probably know what it is already but I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I've been making my entire life, not saying the hard things when the hard things are the necessary things that I need to say. My sons are a product of what I should have, what I did and I shouldn't have done. Right. You know, when it comes to communicating hard truth to people, if God directs you, and first of all, I'm gonna give you a bit of disclaimer. 
If you're starting to make a list right now of all these people in your life, in your family, your coworkers, people in your church that you're gonna communicate hard truth, understand what's going on here though. This is in the context of relationship, okay? This is actually in the context of permission. <laughs> Communicating hard truth always goes better when it is in the context of relationship. Eli and Samuel had a good relationship, and we also see that Eli gave permission for Samuel to communicate this hard truth. And I'm not saying that it's always that easy, or that's always going to be the case. But hard truth is always better received in the context of positive relationship and permission. Sometimes there are people who will come into my office and, and they give me permission. They, they say, here's the, here's the mess that is my marriage, or here's the mess that, that is my finances, or here's, here's, the, here's, here's the mess, what should I do? You know, at that point, it's easy to, to speak truth because they've, they've given you permission and there's kind of a relationship there. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes the Lord may prompt you to speak hard truth to somebody that you don't know very well. You may not have a relationship or the benefit of being in this type of a context, but hard truth always is better received when there is a relationship and when there's permission. So if you're starting to make that make the list of all these people, hold the phone, you need to check your motives a little bit. I don't think that Samuel wanted to communicate this hard truth. He was given permission. He was in a context of a relationship. That's not always possible, but when it is possible, it seems to be much more better received. Something for us to consider. Here's number three that we see. Consider the source of truth and be willing to separate the truth from its source. Now, what does this mean? Am I just double talking? Well, let's look at the scripture. What was it that he said to you, Eli asked? Do you not hide it from me? May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. This is Eli, 90 years old, telling this to a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy. You are allowed to speak 